this was the remit I was given by Tim, uh, Fiscal Activism in Britain, 76 to 2008. Um, I thought I'd sort of set out some ground rules. Um, so fiscal activism, it's the active use of discretionary fiscal policy to smooth out the economic cycle. Without fiscal activism is, I've, I've called fiscal conservatism, and that basically says that you decide how much the government can spend just by looking at what the income is, not by anything silly like, you know, uh, is demand matching supply in the real economy. Uh, policy success, I think uh, Kirk, Dirk has just said it really, we want stable output growth, stable and low inflation, stable and low unemployment. Um, and I had to add this last one because the, the, the conservatism was tried at a very high level of inflation, a downward and a steady secular downward trend in inflation, I think is also an example of, of uh, a measure of policy success. Um, so let me start by looking at the fiscal deficit from 1948 up to 2018. And really this, these next few slides are asking the question, was fiscal conservative, conservatism really tried? Uh, and certainly, and we had in um, Robert's speech last night, he actually uh, mentioned both these two salient points in economic history. One is James Callaghan talking to the Labour Party conference, no less, saying, I tell you in all candor, that option no longer exists. That is spending your way out of recession using Keynesian policies. Um, and then Nigel Lawson writing a, a bit after he'd actually started doing uh, medium term financial strategy, um, saying that the major major purpose of macro policy is the conquest of inflation. If we want to get unemployment down, we've got to do clever micro things to get the labour market working better. So certainly, those in charge thought uh, that things had changed. Um, but if you look, and I follow Tim here, I think the, the government deficit is a, you know, a pretty good measure of everything we're talking about in this session. Uh, if you ask the question, did you have, uh, as it were, um, a, a more or less activist policy in the 1948 to 76 period or afterwards, if you just look at the public deficit uh, measured in pounds, um, you'd say, well, totally ridiculous. It was clearly much more active afterwards. Um, but that's not actually not entirely fair. Uh, because if, if you look properly at the um, at the public sector deficit as a share of GDP, you therefore normalise and get rid of the effects of inflation, um, you do have a much more ambiguous picture. And I want to make two points really. One is that, um, again, if you look on the right-hand side in the period of so-called fiscal conservatism, there were two major bits of backsliding in the period I've been asked to assess very clearly, and the deficit goes up um, after the Lawson boom and, and under George Brown, under, <laughs> under Gordon Brown. Um, but if you actually look at the record, uh, statistical record, look, using standard measures like means and variances of the public sector deficit as a share of GDP, <laughs> what you discover is that in the period of uh, fiscal conservatism, it was actually on average higher. Um, but at least the variance was a bit less, the standard deviation was down. Um, so, I mean, yes, it was, I mean, I think you know, something did clearly change, uh, and um, I'm going to go on to say, those who recommend, and on the whole, I, I'm, I am in this camp, I do, I do believe the sensible thing to do with the public sector deficit is to have it kind of stable and low, um, but there are terrible, terrible forces working in the opposite direction, which is what this slide uh, reminds us all of, which is to say that basically conservative governments, when they get to power, they want to cut taxes. When Labour governments get to power, they want to uh, put up public spending. You can see very clearly uh, in the red and blue periods how that happens. And you can see um, really the fiscal deficit always comes second in any of these political judgments. So that Gordon Brown, uh, when he did want to increase public spending, by then, the orthodoxy, the political orthodoxy, is you can't win elections if you put up taxes. So he spent and massively increased the deficit. So, and the other, I mean, the other thing, and this is one area where I think I do probably disagree with Tim. I do actually think that in the short term, in the very short term, uh, and I, you know, I start from the Keynesian model where it's, you know, y is equal to c plus i plus um, x plus, plus x minus m. Um, if you increase G, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, if you increase G, you do get an increase in Y, but not for terribly long, uh, I don't think. And, and of course, 
another reason why I think Tim is essentially right is that uh, actually there are so many leakages when you put up uh, government spending. You know, some of it goes on imports, uh, some of it goes on tax, a lot of it goes on tax, 50% of GDP is tax, uh, and of course some is saved, and between all those things, uh, not much survives in the longer term. So here are the, the key episodes uh, since the war, <coughs> and I'm not going to read them out. What I am going to say is that since I was, I was very active in this debate um, mm -hmm. all those years ago, uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 70s and uh, right through the 80s and through the early 90s. And I'm going to talk about what I know. Uh, I, I would love to do an assessment of fiscal activism under Gordon Brown, but I didn't have the time uh, or the sort of reservoir of knowledge. So I'm going to look at the economic outturns, first of all. And I'm, I'm still in the mode of looking, you know, as it were, like an American econometrician knowing nothing, but just looking at the numbers and saying, first of all, you know, was, was fiscal activism tried? Well, it, it was a bit. It got a bit more stable, but uh, actually the deficit went up a bit. But what was the effect um, of that on the things that really matter? Well, you know, sadly for those who, like me, do actually believe in fiscal conservatism, we have a bit of a, a problem here, which is that uh, the rate of growth actually came down uh, in the later period, 76 to 2008, uh, and of course down again after the, the banking crisis. Um, but I would argue that isn't, I don't think that's an argument saying it was all because there wasn't enough fiscal expansion going on. I, I really don't, I'm, I'm with Tim on that. Uh, and there's a very well-known argument which says actually, uh, it, we may have grown more slowly, but we rejoined the pack. So it, everyone grew more slowly after, basically after the first oil crisis in 1973. Uh, and, and, and there are the numbers. In the period 61 to 73 of fiscal activism, we clearly grew more slowly than everybody. Uh, then after 73, everyone grows more slowly, and we are, as I say, we have, we have joined the pack. So that argument, I think, doesn't count as an argument against uh, fiscal conservatism. The argument that I think is very much in favour of fiscal conservatism is, as we all know, um, the, in 1976 there was a horrendous rate of inflation. Callaghan made his speech, he made his famous about turn at the airport uh, to go and ask for some money for the IMF. They imposed conditions. A couple of years later, Mrs. Thatcher comes to power, implements the medium term financial strategy, and uh, the rest is history. Inflation comes down very dramatically. So that all, that all worked. Um, how did it work? Well, of course, the, the nigger in the woodpile is the rate of unemployment, which has been much, much higher under the period of fiscal conservatism, and, and perhaps that is the price you have to pay to have lower inflation. Uh, I don't know. So, it's not, I think, this kind of American econometrician way of looking at things, it's not, I think, very conclusive. Uh, it's not a controlled experiment. An awful lot you know, affects the economy other than fiscal policy, including monetary policy, the exchange rate, uh, and things like the underlying kind of ability of the economy to produce. Um, the one thing, as I say, that's clear is that inflation fell. Now let me look at the episodes. And as I said, this, this becomes much, much more detailed. But uh, I want to make a point, first of all, a kind of conceptual point. My, my years since 1993, when I left the world of macro, uh, and I've spent time as a consultant, has enamored me of the famous McKinsey two by two matrix. And here is a small <laughs> example. Uh, so there are four states of the world. The real economy can be strong or weak. The budget deficit can be below target or above target. Uh, and we look at the policy recommendations. Now, if the real economy is weak and the budget is below target, then of course both a conserv fiscal conservative would say, of course you can expand because uh, you're, you're, you know, you've, got, you've got headroom on, on the deficit. Uh, and the case would say, of course you must expand because you want to get demand up. And conversely, uh, if the budget is above target and the economy is strong, uh, Keynesian would say, would say, put up taxes to control demand and uh, the fiscal conservative would say, put up taxes, you need the money. But there are these two cases where uh, they deliver absolutely opposite uh, recommendations. And the, um, the um, case where the budget uh, deficit, where the economy is strong, I think I might have labeled this wrong way around, where the, the, where the economy is strong uh, and you um, have a 
in, the, in the case of 1981, what we had was a desperately weak economy, uh, and we had um, also a, um, a, a budget deficit that needed um, it, that needed reducing. And so you had the the one re the, the fiscal conservative recommendation was to put up taxes. Uh, the Keynes recommendation was to cut taxes. And it, it, in the 1988 case, it was exactly inverse. Let me come and look at that in a bit more detail. So 1981, uh, we have, uh, this is what the medium term financial strategy said. It said we are going to uh, cut government spending um, and we're going to put up, uh, sorry, we're going, to, we're going to put up taxes and we're going to cut government spending. Uh, and as Tim said, I think that argument was won hands down by the Conservatives. Uh, the fiscal conservatives, because uh, as as it were, the most important thing was that inflation came down. That was the main aim of putting up the taxes and getting the deficit down. But but look what happened to growth. There was a very strong recovery, uh, and even although it took a lot longer, uh, we got we started to get employment coming down. Employment was always the as I say the, was the, was the real problem with the Thatcher government because uh, that ne that never looked good. But but getting uh, growth going again certainly did. Uh, happen. Now, there's a quite an interesting bit of history here. How was it that that budget increase in taxes at allegedly the depths of a recession uh, produced growth? Uh, and as I say, I was at the time operating a Keynesian model, so was the Treasury. And the most important thing is what happens to consumption. Um, and here was what the Treasury model said. It said, your savings stock should be a proportion of your nominal income. Divide through by Y, and that says the change in, take first differences and divide through by Y. The change in the savings stock, that is the flow of new savings, divided by income i.e. the savings ratio, uh, should be proportional to the rate of growth of nominal income. And that says that if you get the rate of growth of nominal income down, then uh, the savings ratio will come down. And if the savings ratio comes down, of course, that means more, more consumption. And here are the numbers. I mean, the savings ratio fell from 13.6 in the fourth quarter of 1980 to 9.3. It's a fall of over 4%. Very roughly, one percentage point on the savings ratio, one percent of extra demand. Uh, so you know, this, was, this was a big positive. Um, of course, that wasn't the only thing going on. Uh, there were higher interest rates um, and a strong exchange rate with other things that helped to bring inflation down. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't just the fiscal tightening, but getting inflation down did boost demand in a way that I think was, you know, was not part of the Keynesian orthodoxy, but became part uh, of the new thinking. Now let me come on to the, the really the obverse of that, uh, which was basically, I'd call it a, oops, a, a contractually fiscal expansion. Um, the first thing I want you to do is look down the diagonals. So these were the outturns. So th this was a period when clearly the fiscal deficit were, was reduced from 3.5% of GDP and turned into a surplus. What I also want you to notice, if you look from the top to the bottom down each of the columns, the experience before uh, 1985 was that generally, as normally happens with targets, they, they were overshot. That is to say, they didn't quite manage to get the deficit down as quickly as they had planned. But afterwards, they undershot. And that was the extraordinary background to the 1988 uh, Lawson budget. So that things were just going better than had been expected on the fiscal front for reasons which they have a great deal to do with corporation tax and the 1984 budget and the fact that Nigel Lawson cut corporation tax rates, there was a kind of Laffer curve effect of a curious sort, which is that people rushed to declare their profits in the United Kingdom because transfer pricing rules are not that strict uh, and um, corporation tax revenue was sort of amazing. But it wasn't just that and I think we don't quite understand why that extraordinary thing happened for four years that everything turned out better uh, than expected. What you'll observe in this famously fiscally conservative government of Mrs Thatcher was that, that there were two years of contraction, but thereafter all the discretionary changes were actually uh, in the direction of pushing up the budget deficit, uh, boosting the economy. Um, and yet, as I've shown you, the deficit came steadily down. How, how could that be? Well, the standard answer is, well, there were privatisation proceeds, of course, wonderful little bonanza, worth five billion by the end. 
and there was the North Sea revenues. But actually, if you look over the whole period, of course, yes, they went up, uh, but then they went down again, because they couldn't last forever. And if you look at the numbers here, actually what you find is the government gave away 10.8 billion, of which only 7.9 was financed by privatization and North Sea oil. So they gave away another, two, they borrowed another 2.9 for tax cuts on top of all these bonanzas, and yet the fiscal deficit fell. Uh, by 8 billion or 2.3 percent of GDP. That's all the numbers available at the time. If you look at today's numbers, which are always different from the numbers you were used to, uh, you discover uh, it's a similar sort of story that the deficit clearly did fall. So, on his own precepts uh, of of on his own precepts of, of, of fiscal conservatism, Nigel Lawson felt he had plenty of money to spend, and he wanted to cut taxes. Tory chancellors always do, and he did. And I have to say, on this part of the debate, uh, the Keynes have said you can't do this, the, the economy is already overheating, it will be a disaster. And, and by and large, they were right. Uh, what we had, as you can see, the consequences of this expansionary fiscal policy uh, was that, that inflation, after all that hard work getting it down to 4.1%, went up again to 6.9%. GDP growth uh, in 1988 unsustainably at 5.7. It came and we moved into the, uh, the recession. Um, you can see what had to happen to interest rates. Um, there's a very important story here which you will all be remembering and one I'm going to mention, which is a little matter of joining the exchange rate mechanism. Um, and my story about that, which is why I've actually gone to the trouble of putting the data from the Bank of England um, spreadsheets, uh, showing all the changes when they actually occurred in the, the minimum band one dealing rate, which was the, the bank rate at the time. We had the tax cutting budget, uh, it was 8.3. A year later, uh, interest rates were up to 13.8%. Lawson resigned, so ba basically the, the bad monetary consequences of this bad piece of fiscal planning uh, were in place. Uh, Lawson resigns. Then, a year later, we joined the ERM. And I, my version of the story is that actually what happened there was that the, the damage was done by the budget, uh, and then we couldn't undo the damage. We couldn't get interest rates down when the recession struck because we'd entered the ERM. All a very, very unhappy uh, policy-making episodes. But my conclusion basically is that uh, what all, all Lawson did by this ill-judged expansion was put up a real interest rates uh, to quite a, I mean, really historically unusual and quite shocking level. Um, well, a lot of that was all about the election, which is why I showed you the election slide, um, and I was very much part of that period uh, working at the Treasury. Uh, and we had this ghastly experience of very, very high interest rates, uh, an approaching election, a deep, deep recession, we couldn't do anything about it. And astonishingly, um, the Conservatives won that election, uh, and then immediately afterwards, uh, to his <coughs> great credit, Norman Lamont put in place um, a, another contractory budget. And this was a fiscal innovation, he, he showed five years, actually, of, of pr proposed tax changes. Uh, to give, as it were, the markets confidence. This was a new government. It could plan for five years of fiscal changes. Uh, it did so, um, and uh, the, the aim was to get the PSBR uh, as a share of GDP down from the shocking 8% down to 5.5%. And it turned out, you can see what happened, 5.75 in 93, 94, and then next year, it had gone up again to 7.75, uh, in the meantime, um, Lamont had resigned, but you had uh, uh, Ken Clark and the same Treasury team, and to his great credit, Clark bought into this story, and we had another huge bite at the cherry uh, to actually get the, uh, the, the PSBR as a share of GDP down. So we had two successive contractory budgets, uh, and the result, as you can see, inflation was held down and GDP growth uh, was steady and, if anything, increasing. Uh, and at long last, we start to see um, unemployment come down. So those are my three <coughs> stories. <coughs> and before I draw my conclusion, I just wanted to show you one chart, which I have to say changed my mind. Um, because what I was going to argue was that in 1981, a contractory budget 
was able to be expansionary because the rate of inflation could come down because it was very high and that bring the savings ratio down and that would cause more consumer spending to happen. And I wasn't at all sure about Osborne's uh, cuts because it, inflation was already low. So weren't they just going to be contractionary? Well, um, here is, as I say, I think, I, I was astonished when I saw how impressive this correlation is. So the savings ratio and the public sector deficit. Savings ratio, percentage of disposable income, public sector deficit, percentage of GDP. Um, they are pretty comparable in the sense, in sense of their, their effect on real demand, because um, you know consumption is 70% of, of GDP. Uh, so a, a change in the savings ratio is, you know, can offset a change in the public sector deficit. And you can see here that by and large they did. I mean, in this period the correlation was extraordinary. Um, what happened? Uh, th there are one or two episodes, and this is one I think example which goes. I think what Robert will like, and, and Tim won't. Uh, that in 1993 or thereabouts, uh, we did have um, th this period is under Gordon Brown, uh, where the the, um, the public sector deficit uh, is is put up, um, and the savings ratio doesn't budge. So that was actually a fiscal expansion, which it seems to me actually did work. Um, but then we had subsequently much, much, much bigger, including, of course, the bailout of the banks, and then, of course, the savings ratio. Uh, you know, confidence is shaken, and the savings ratio goes up. But the thing that changed my mind is that this fall in the public sector deficit under Osborne um, actually did bring down the savings ratio, and the numbers are almost identical, actually, to the numbers there. So that, that long uh, fiscal contraction, uh, which, as it were, got its reward in the form of a boost in the savings ratio and you know, therefore plenty of growth, um, was repeated. And if we've had slower growth since, um, you know, as we have done, undoubtedly, sadly, uh, since the Great Recession, um, I fear it's got something to do with the supply side, productivity, etc., and not very much to do um, with the, the, fact, the fiscal contraction. And I'm, I'm rather saddened to say that because it, it, has, it is my view, and I think those of you at the dinner last night, I asked Robert a question, because I do sort of think that actually a bit of extra public investment in that period would not have done any harm. And the government could have borrowed, uh, could have employed a bit of modern monetary theory and said, well, let's just spend the money for heaven's sake. Uh, or they could even say we can borrow to do it because um, Frankly, at 2% of the market is screaming for us to borrow. Uh, we must be able to find things that yield 2%. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm ambiguous on, on, on that part of the story. But as I say, I was, I was quite surprised to see how very positive, as it were, the effect on, on, on um, confidence and therefore the savings ratio had been. And, and Tim is quite right to point out the astonishing miracle that is Greece. I can't, I can't, I can't try to follow it closely because I go there every year. Here are my conclusions, um, and I, I suppose they're fairly wishy-washy and dull, um, as befits someone who spent too many years in Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, I think my first point is that, uh, yes, a fiscal contraction has historically been pretty clearly followed by, and I think I would go so far as to say caused by, um, uh, sorry, followed by and, and, and therefore, are, are in, in some sense, are the cause of uh, lower inflation, certainly, and it, it appears higher growth, which I think is, is the surprise, but that is what the data shows. And this is probably one of the reasons why Tim's regression comes out and comes out, come, come out as they do. Um, the second point, fiscal expansions, you know, c can do the opposite, usually. Uh, that is to say, they're, they're often a very bad idea. The Barber boom was a very bad idea. The Lawson boom was a very bad idea. But the Brown expansion in 2000 actually, I think, turned out quite well. Um, the third thing is that, we, that, curiously, the Lawson boom of uh, 2000 and, uh, sorry, of, of 1988 was in some sense an example of, of, a, of a conservative fiscal policy. He, he was running the ship, as it were, just looking at that one dial, uh, which was uh, the public sector deficit. And the public sector deficit said you can spend more, so he did. Um, so, but that was a great mistake. Uh, and I think my conclusion from that, my very boring conclusion, is that yes, I'm, I think what happened 
you know, after Callaghan and, and Thatcher made their respective changes, was to give a great deal more emphasis to the state of the public finances in deciding whether you could or could not um, cut taxes. Um, but that you, you should entirely throw away the Keynesian apparatus and modeling of demand uh, and the fact that there is such a thing as you know, excess capacity and pressure on demand which creates inflation, all of those things, I think it was, was a huge mistake and, and Lawson did effectively throw all that away in 1988 when he decided, to, I mean, against the advice of his officials, uh, to cut taxes to that large extent. Uh, the fourth point I wanted to make, which was in the, the chart, I, well, the detailed chart I showed you of endless budgets and their outturns, uh, is that unfortunately fiscal revenues are very inherently unstable and they do just kind of come and go. Uh, and that's another reason why uh, it's not a terrifically good idea uh, always to say, insist you know, that you must be aiming for budget balance. If a great mass of revenue comes in, as did in the late 80s, uh, Lawson was tempted to spend it and he yielded to that temptation and it was the wrong decision. Uh, he should have just let those extraordinary fiscal events uh, show up uh, in a lower deficit. What, you know, what harm would that have done? Two minutes. I've got two minutes. I'm only going to take two seconds. Um, the fiscal deficit finally... Um, yes, that was sorry. Uh, but, but, so my, my, my final point really is that um, obviously um, you, know, you all know that it isn't just fiscal policy that serves how the economy goes. There's lots going on. Monetary policy is massively important. Uh, I believe that the, 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 the exchange rate is massively important. Um, all the microeconomic factors which determine the rate of growth and productive potential are you know, hugely important. Uh, and I think my final word is that um, you, know, you, you do need a large, I think, you know, a, a, a lot of modelling of, of different aspects of, of the economy to get these things right. Um, but I think my, my, my last word is that, yes, uh, fiscal contractions on the whole seem to have done more good than harm. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>